In this video I'd like to show you a book of prayers. Um, it says here on the cover page 1867, but that's when it was reprinted. This collection of private devotions was originally printed in 1627, and it is by John Coson, who was once the Bishop of Durham in England. The volume is uh, case-bound. It's a glued hardback with heavy paper. Very little show through. The font is about nine and a half points throughout. As I make the video today, I will be using another publication. This is a Glory, Laud, and Honor, The Arts of the Anglican Counter-Reformation by Graham Perry. I think the title here is a bit misleading uh, because I don't believe there was anything that could qualify as an Anglican Counter-Reformation in the same sense as the Roman Catholic Counter-Reformation. These were reformers in England who took the Reformation in a different direction from the um, Calvinist approach that had prevailed earlier in the 16th century. One of the things I'd like to do first is to show you the title page from the 1627 printing. So this is from the volume I just showed you. Um, and you can see it was decorated quite a lot differently. And when it was originally printed, uh, U's were printed as V's. Which gives you the date there, 1627. Someone is playing a harp, some bearded king at the bottom, and the inscription is the title page to Cosin's Devotions, 1627. Here is a slide I've drawn giving you an overview of his life, along with a portrait of John Cosin. And I'll read to you what uh, Graham Perry says about his life. I don't have a good biography of him present, but... Um, Perry gives some biographical information that's useful. He says, uh, John Cosin, 1594 to 1672, that birth date's a bit different from what you see on the chart, started as fellow of Caius College, Cambridge, becoming a chaplain to Bishop John Overall in 1616. Richard Neal appointed him as his domestic chaplain on Overall's death in 1619. And... As a result of Neil's patronage as Bishop of Durham, Cozen was appointed to several livings in the area around Durham. His breakthrough came when, we, when he was appointed Master of Peterhouse in succession to Wren in 1635, when he became the standard bearer of Laudian values in Cambridge. Ejected from Peterhouse in 1644, he went into exile in Paris, where he became chaplain to the Royalists, who had remained faithful to the Church of England during the Interregnum. The grandest phase of his life was as Bishop of Durham after the Restoration, when he was able to indulge his passion for building and furnishing, and also able to exercise his profound knowledge of liturgical history in the creation of the 1662 Book of Common Prayer. If you'd like to know where Durham is, it's here in the north of England, just south of Hadrian's Wall. And there's a photo of Durham Cathedral from the outside. And we will pan down and over. And you can see what it looks like in the inside. The ribbing of the roof there. Cosin's prayer book here has an approbation from George Montaigne, who was Bishop of London in 1626. This says February 22, 1626, but I believe um, we would refer to that as 1627, since the English in those days were not yet on the Gregorian calendar. On the following page, we see the table of contents. Now in England, by this time, we had a book of common prayer. But Cosin's notion here is to give you a book for use in private devotions, similar to the primers that were used in medieval times. So here's the outline. We have a preface, the calendar, which is the calendar from the prayer book, 
the Apostles' Creed divided into 12 articles, the Lord's Prayer and seven petitions, the Ten Commandments. So all this is sort of heuristic uh, teaching information, then a collection of private devotions for the hours of prayer. And he talks to you about the ancient and the custom times of prayer in this section. Pan down and let you see the rest of the table of contents there. The second page of the table of contents has the seven penitential psalms. Psalms here are the psalms from Matthew's Bible. They're largely Coverdale's work, the litany, the collects for Sundays and holy days through the year, prayers before receiving the blessed sacrament. Now that may strike some of you as strange who are thinking of the Anglican Church, Church of England at that time as being like a modern evangelical church. It was not. Prayers for the king and queen, prayers for ember weeks, prayers for the sick, prayers and thanksgivings for sundry purposes. The preface begins with a paragraph that reads, For the good and welfare of our souls, there is not in Christian religion anything of like continual use and force throughout every hour of our lives, as is the ghostly exercise of prayer and devotion. After describing the Lord's Prayer as the pattern of prayer, he goes on to give four reasons for this book of devotions. The first is to continue and preserve the authority of the ancient laws and old godly canons of the church, and to avoid, as near as might be, all extemporal effusions of irksome and indigested prayers, which they use to make that herein are subject to no good order or form of words, but pray both what and how and when they list. The second reason is to let the world understand that they who give it out and accuse us here in England to have set up a new church and a new faith, to have abandoned all the ancient forms of piety and devotion, to have taken away all the religious exercises and prayers of our forefathers, to have despised all the old ceremonies and cast behind us the blessed sacraments of Christ's Catholic Church, that these men do little else but betray their own infirmities and have more violence and will than reason or judgment for what they say. The common accusations which, out of the abundance of those partial affections that transport them the wrong way, they are pleased to bring so frequently against us being but the bare reports of such people as either do not or will not understand us what we are. The third reason is that they who are this way already religiously given and whom earnest lets and impediments do often hinder from being partakers of the public might have here a daily and devout order of private prayer. The last is, this is the fourth reason, that those who perhaps are but coldly this way yet affected might by others' example be stirred up to the like heavenly duty of performing their daily and Christian devotions to Almighty God as being a work of all others the most acceptable to his divine majesty. In discussing the calendar, Cousin points out that this faith of ours is the same as that wherein the holy angels are set to succor us, in which the glorious company of the apostles, the noble army of martyrs, and the godly fellowship of other God's saints and servants, men famous in their generations before us, have some maintained with the sanctity of their lives, and some sealed with the innocency of their deaths, for this cause that the names of those holy and heavenly saints are still preserved in the calendar of the church, there to remain upon record and register, as of old time they did, where they might also stand as sacred memorials of God's mercy towards us as forcible witnesses of his ancient truth. After the calendar, Cosin gives the Apostles' Creed, divided into twelve articles, and at the bottom he has an annotation, By this faith we learn to believe in God the Father, in God the Son, and in God the Holy Spirit. Following the Apostles' Creed we see the Lord's Prayer, divided into seven petitions, and then the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments goes on for a few pages. He talks about then, after having listed them, 
the duties enjoined and the sins for, forbidden by each of the commandments. So under those who offend against the sixth commandment, thou shalt do no murder, he says, um, these are psalm, those that procure or consent to the procuring of abortive children. Among offenders against the seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, he includes they that are luxurious in their diet and abuse their bodies either by gluttony or drunkenness. And of course, they that keep open or private stews. It's an older term for a brothel. The Ten Commandments are followed by the two precepts of charity or the laws of nature, to love God, to love all men as ourselves, followed by the precepts of the church, verse 3 being to keep uh, to observe the festivals and holy days, to keep the fasting days, to observe the ecclesiastical customs. Continuing on the next page, so to observe the ecclesiastical customs and ceremonies established, and that without forwardness or contradiction. So you can see there a bit of a jab against the Puritans to repair into the public service of the church for matins and even song to receive the blessed sacrament of the body and blood of Christ with frequent devotion and three times a year at least. Uh, the medieval custom was once a year, so three times as frequently. We come down to the sacraments of the church and he says there are two principal sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper, and the other five Though they sometimes be called and have the name of sacraments, yet have they not the like nature that the two principal and true sacraments have. Three, the three theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity. Three kinds of good works. Go to the next page. <clears throat> the duties of the commandments. Seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. Twelve fruits of the Holy Ghost, spiritual works of mercy, corporal works of mercy, the eight Beatitudes, the seven deadly sins, the contrary virtues, and the four last things. Kosin gives us a set of short prayers to be committed unto perfect memory for our first holy exercise in the beginning of the day. So, lighten mine eyes, O Lord, that I sleep not in death, is one. Their prayers to be said at our uprising, at our apparelling, at the washing of hands, humbly commending ourselves to God's protection upon our knees, at our going abroad, when we hear the clock at any hour of the day, and upon entering the church, when you come into the choir, when we fall down to worship and adore before the presence of God, and then a divine hymn preparative to prayer. Then Kosin gives us a little essay concerning the division of the day into various hours of prayer. The uh, first, third, sixth, and ninth. So I will just pan down and let you pause and read that. And then we have a discussion of the first hour or morning prayers, the antiquity of morning prayers. And various uh, scriptural passages that discuss morning prayer. And you'll see this in this prayer book for all of the hours of prayer. And so there's another page that I've skipped over of scriptural references to morning prayer. And then we come to a section called From the Fathers, where he has a few passages from early Christian writers talking about prayer in the morning. And that continues for another page and a half. And so after some preparatory prayers, we have the matins or morning prayer for the first hour of the day. That's 
versicles, the venite, a hymn, antiphons, psalms, again from Coverdale, not the King James Version. These predate that. A benediction, a lesson from Solomon, a song of St. Ambrose, an antiphon, more psalms. Another lesson, the Creed, the Curie, then the Colics, the Colics for the Weak, which we'll see later on, the Colic for Peace, the Colic for Grace, Devout Prayer to be used at all times, and then the Final Prayers. Then you'll see we have a similar structure here. There's an introduction to the third hour of prayers, uh, patristic evidence for this in the early church. We move on to the prayers for the third hour. Vini Creator, more Psalms. Section on the sixth hour of prayer or patristic evidence for it after the biblical witnesses. Ninth hour, the same structure. He likes uh, to refer to Basil, Basil and Jerome. Prayers at Vespers, even song. Prayers for the evening. Magnificat comes in now. The Creed again. And then the benediction. A prayer for when we enter into our bed. And then we're in the next section, the seven penitential psalms. The litany. Other, no other traditions have multiple litanies, but this is the litany in the Church of England. Then we're in the section for the colics, for the Sundays and holy days through the year. That takes us quite a number of pages forward. A section of devout prayers that may be used before and after the receiving of Christ's holy sacrament, his blessed body and blood. So we have prayers before the receiving of the Blessed Sacrament. Uh, at the Consecration, the hymn, the prayer. So we have three sections of prayer here. Heavenly aspirations immediately before the receiving of the Blessed Sacrament prayer at the receiving, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word, my soul shall be healed, uh, adding with the priest, uh, words the priest says, at the uh, receiving of the communion, the distribution, thanksgivings af after receiving, meditations while others are communicating, doxology, then we go to diverse forms of devout and penitent confessions for our sin to be used as at other times, but especially before receiving Christ's blessed sacrament according to the direction of the church. Exhortation before the communion, the preparation, and confession. Other forms of general confessions. And then another section, prayers for the king and queen. A 
prayers for the four ember weeks. He gives a little essay there on the history of ember weeks. Psalms. Prayers proper to the four um, several ember weeks. Prayers for the sick. Prayers at the hour of death. Prayers and thanksgivings for sundry purposes. Prayer for the whole estate of Christ's church, for our parents, another for our parents, for our children, prayer to be used by women that travail, and another for the same purpose, a thanksgiving after childbirth, a thanksgiving for recovery from sickness, a prayer in time of war, a thanksgiving for peace and victory, prayer in the time of any common plague, thanksgiving for deliverance from any plague, prayers for to say on your birthday, a prayer wherewith St. Augustine began his devotions, admiring the unspeakable majesty and attributes of God. Here on the right. And last page, a prayer wherewith to conclude all our devotions and the blessing. And then, of course, in 1867, they were advertising some of their other books. And uh, Lancelot Andrews' uh, devotions looks interesting. I may have to get a copy of that at some point. So that's a flyover tour of John Coson's uh, 1627 collection of private devotions. Thanks very much for watching.